What are mitochondria? These are tiny little things that exist in nearly every single cell in our human bodies. I think only red blood cells don't have them. Each, each of the other cells contains between one and 2,000. These organelles, mitochondria, play an essential role in, our, in the functioning of our body. Just to list a few things, the creation of energy, the creation of adenosine triphosphate, ATP, takes place within the mitochondria. Mitochondria are essential for the production of neurotransmitters, hormones, RNA, DNA, lipids, proteins, and so on. They are essential for the, the regulating our levels of iron, calcium, glucose, lactate, lipids, reactive oxygen species. They are a, micro, micro, uh, mitochondria are also a signal, signaling agent. And they're essential to the functioning of our central nervous system, our intestinal microbiota, our circadian, metabolic, and immune systems. And they're also essential for the proper functioning of our genes through uh, gene expression and, and uh, epigenetic pathways. So really, really important to our functioning. Without mitochondria, we basically would be dead. But, and by the way, mitochondria are inherited only through our mothers. So all of our mitochondria came from only from our mothers, which is why you have the term mitochondrial DNA, because it's DNA that tracks your maternal lineage. And then also you have that term, the mitochondrial Eve, referring to the first woman that we supposedly came from. Now, it's, it's no surprise, seeing how important mitochondria are, it's no surprise to see the, the wide range of diseases that are connected to mitochondrial disorders. And you can look at this in your own time, pause it and look at it, but pretty much you've got everything in there from various new neurodegenerative disorders, dementia, language delays, various developmental disorders, to anemia, to infertility. Now this is a huge list of, of conditions and diseases which are caused by mitochondrial dysfunction. It's a really, really, impor really, really important uh, organelle we're talking about here. Now, one of the things that causes mitochondria problems is what's known as oxidative damage. And to, to, to give a very, very quick overview, oxidative damage is caused by these things called reactive oxygen species. And reactive oxygen species, including their subset of them, which is called free radicals, these are atoms or molecules that basically cause damage and, and uh, malfunction in our, in our tissues and, and organs. What basically happens with a free radical in this case is that whereas most normal atoms contain a nucleus surrounded by electrons which are in pairs, two by two, like in Noah's Ark, that's a normal atom. But what can sometimes happen as a result of some phenomenon that we're, that we're going to talk about in a minute one of those electrons can can be separated from the atom and that can cause the electron to that that can cause the atom or the molecule to become extremely reactive and it will seek to go and steal an electron from another atom or molecule and that is the root cause of oxidative damage if that keeps going on then the the, the tissues can fail the the cells can die and our organs can ultimately malfunction or or fail completely Oxidative damage, uh, what, what causes oxidative damage? I think that's important to point out before we go back to the, the kind of chemistry of it. Oxidative damage is, in part, a normal part of our day-to-day -day functioning. Remember we talked about how mit in the mitochondria, you have the creation of ATP. And that ATP, that creation of ATP in itself can cause the production of these reactive oxygen species, or ROS. Also, inflammation can lead to the can lead to the formation of these uh, these atoms and molecules. Smoking, unsurprisingly, ionizing radiation, air pollution, uh, and also ultraviolet light can cause the formation of free radicals, which is what's the association. That's the association between UV light, UVB light in particular, and skin cancer. And of course, we'll talk about this in in a future video, but. Um, Eumelanin is a hugely important molecule in the protection of us as humans from the, uh, the oxidative damage that can be caused unwittingly by ultraviolet light. Now, how does our body deal with these 
these uh, reactive oxygen species and free radicals? Well, we do this through through what are called antioxidants. I'm sure you've heard the term antioxidant before. A very common term. It's just part of normal kind of language these days. But very rarely do you hear it actually defined what they actually are. These are atoms or molecules which have, for whatever reason, an abundance of electrons. They've got spare electrons. Remember, the free radicals are those that are missing an, ele an electron, and they're trying to te teeth the electrons from another atom or molecule. These antioxidants can actually donate their electrons to the free radicals and then and thus neutralizing those free radicals. That's what antioxidants do. In light, one of the main things that antioxidants do, this is called this is called redux, reducing the oxidation. Then they do that by donating elect electrons to these free radicals and reactive oxygen species. But antioxidants also do a also counteract oxidative damage in a number of other ways. They can just destroy them. They can they can completely consume them. They can bind to metals that are causing problems. Antioxidants are hugely hugely important. The way that our bodies keep keep themselves in alive, our bodies stay alive by having a good balance between ROS, reactive oxygen species, which again are a normal part of our daily function, but are also called by, caused by those other less normal you know, nefarious things. We have to have the right balance between those and the antioxidants. When we don't, when we have too much, too many ROS, too many of these uh, rogue atoms and molecules, and not enough of the the medicinal antioxidant ones, that's what causes oxidative stress. And it shouldn't surprise you to, to know that oxidative stress is the cause of a, a very, very, very wide range of very fundamental diseases from cancers to uh, heart failure to arthritis to HIV, autoimmune di di disorders, diabetes, preeclampsia, asthma, cancers, you know, hugely, hugely important. Our body's ability to defend ourselves against oxidative stress is essential if we're going to avoid getting one or more of these conditions. And this is where melatonin comes into play. Melatonin, as I said, is one of the most powerful antioxidants in the body, uh, whereas vitamin C, for example, can counteract one, uh, one of these Rosses, reactive oxygen species, melatonin can counteract 10. It's a very, very, it's a, it's a hugely important hormone, melatonin, and antioxidant. This is a list on the screen of just a few of the uh, functions of melatonin. We've, we've talked about the circadian regulation already, but look, you've got neuroprotection, retinal functioning, mood modulation, immunomodulation, which is modulating our immune system, anti-inflammatory with blood pressure regulation, and we've talked already about its free radical scavenging and, and uh, antioxidant uh, powers. Now, what's really important to know is that although, although Melatonin is kind of more famous for being the sleep hormone because it's secreted by the pineal gland at night. We also can produce melatonin in various other parts of the body. And this can be seen by, by this study here where they got some participants to embark on, on some exercise in the morning. So, you know, at a time where there shouldn't have been any circadian melatonin, no melatonin from the pineal gland. And they found that after just 20 minutes of exercise, the levels of melatonin in the blood skyrocketed up to way above the levels that they ever get uh, at night as secreted by the pineal gland. And that continued throughout the exercise, which is a four hour exercise. The melatonin levels in the blood remained high and they only started to taper off uh, an hour or so after the exercise had finished. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you or suggests that melatonin or, or that that confer that gives more hint as to the 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 function of melatonin melatonin obviously when we exercise what happens we put our bodies under an, an enormous amount of stress they start to work harder they're creating more and more energy and we talked about we've talked about how the mitochondria is where energy is created in the body right we talked about that already. And what we're seeing here is that melatonin is also created in the body in the mitochondria, amongst other places. So when during exercise, 
melatonin levels spike up. And where did these where does this melatonin come from? Well, it's not coming from the pineal gland because that melatonin is blocked from coming if it's daytime, if it's bright, as we talked about last week. Where do we get it from? Where is it coming from? Well, we, we can get it from food. We can also get micro, uh, melatonin from our microbiota in our skin, mouth, nose, digestive tract and vagina, which is deep. But we'll come back to that in the future once I've researched that a little bit more. But as I said, melatonin is also created in our mitochondria. So that is a beautiful, beautiful synergy there because we know that the mitochondria is where probably most of the oxidative stress takes place so what better place for melatonin to be synthesized and produced and secreted than in the mitochondria in order to counteract the the damaging effects of that uh, of that oxidative stress and so what it's been found actually is that according to these researchers here Scott Zimmerman and Russell Reiter, who, who I'd highly recommend that you check out for their work around melatonin, they estimate that only 5% of the total melatonin in the human body comes from the pineal gland. And over 95% of it, they propose, is generated within our mitochondria, which, which again makes sense because that's where most of the oxidative stress happens. And they, this is their summary. It has now been shown that the mitochondria produce melatonin in many cells in quantities which are orders of magnitude higher than that produced in the pineal gland. This subcellular melatonin does not necessarily fluctuate with our circadian clock or release into the circulation system, but instead has been proposed to be consumed locally in response, that is locally within the cell, in response to the free radical density within each cell in particular, in response to near infrared exposure. So the cycle is uh, completely, we're back to talking about light. Melatonin levels in the circadian rhythm are, in the, in the pineal gland, are dictated by light. The absence of light is what causes this pineal gland to release its melatonin. How, however, melatonin is created in much higher volume in our mitochondria, and our mitochondria are absolutely central to our well-being and health. And as we're going to see in a future episode, it has been shown that near-infrared exposure and red light exposure actually triggers the production of melatonin in our mitochondria. <laughs>